This is session. Anyone want to take a guess what session we're in? Six. Six it is, yes. We're in session six of Wait For It or Work For It. Tonight's session entitled Live Like You Were Marching. I like to, to kick off, um, so I'm gonna make that quick statement. Just make sure please that you're muted so we don't get out background noises and sounds from the background. So just check your devices and just make sure it's muted, but unmute if you have a question or a comment at any point. I just don't wanna disturb everyone else with that if you don't mind. Uh, live like you're marching. Again, uh, I'd like to kick our, our sessions off, this particular session off, um, building the foundation, which is article 23. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ believes in Zion, which is the kingdom of God in the flesh. And another name for it, you may hear this spoken in class, in lessons, in studies, in discussions, in sermons. You may hear the, the term, the peaceful reign, same thing. Therein lies a, a city in the, in the top of these mountains called the New Jerusalem. And I believe that to be the capital city for Zion. Uh, herein lies the, probably the most famous fleshly citizen. Is, he will be the choice seer. Uh, if you're looking for a name, just in case you meet him and there's no, we're not wearing name tags in Zion, his name is Joseph. Don't know if he goes by Joe, don't know if he goes by Joey, but you're safe with Joseph. Joseph uh, of the lineage Joseph. Uh, he's a Moses-like figure, we've learned. We've learned that he'll have a convincing spirit that will be utilized among his own people Israel. And that's very exciting. And it says he'll convince them of the things they've already heard. So as our, our brothers and sisters that are, are knocking on doors and telling other people about Jesus Christ, if they get there, even with questions in their minds or doubts, he will come in and confirm everything that they've heard and convince them. Just an exciting game plan. And then lastly, all of this will, will um, come before the millennium, the thousand years with Jesus Christ. If, if and you've heard it as a second coming, by the way, uh, often heard in, in different uh, conversations. Live like you were marching. Week one, and forgive those of you who have been here for five weeks in a row. Forgive me just for maybe two minutes while I catch everybody up and make sure we're on the same page. Um, before the peaceful reign, you have an opportunity to start marching today. And you can march as we were identified um, by, I believe it was Moroni when he said, the, he's speaking to those who, of you who are members of the church, or, and he says, the peaceable followers of Jesus Christ. And in order to be that, he said, you have to be able to walk peaceably among the children of men. So if you want to start marching to Zion, start marching to the peaceful reign, why not start in peace today? Week two, you don't want to miss this one. That, that was the uh, week I tried to um, stand on the proverbial wall myself and blow the trumpets uh, of Zion and, and try to teach you a little bit about what Zion is. Zion is God's planned gathering for Israel. And we who are, are not of the blood, maybe, is there's a couple ways it's written in the word of God. One is grafted in, another way is adopted in. Uh, we who are adopted in or grafted in will also be um, citizens of this city, of this time period. This gathering or dwelling place is, is, is the hot ticket. So you want an invitation to Zion. You don't want to be on the outside looking in of this particular gathering. Uh, and again, I just want to make a point. If you remember, I used the, the example of Joseph. Joseph gathered his brothers together in, in the old world. So it'll be in, in this time period as well. Joseph will gather his brothers together for the great feast called Zion. What are you bringing? Blessed are those who bring forth my Zion at that day it is written in the word. And so the, the challenge to each of you is what are you bringing to fill the table? And what are you bringing today, today as you walk to fill the seats at the, at the table? You have a double calling, double responsibility. One, to bring something of, of, in your talents and two, to bring those with you who need Jesus Christ. Week four was it's your choice to see it, an attempt at cleverness, but I am not a 
Kenny Lombard marketing whiz. So you're just going to have to smile and pretend like there's some cleverness in that title. Uh, and the, the verse that we used was a seer shall my Lord shall the Lord my God raise up, goes on to say, a choice seer unto the fruit of my loin. And it's in that scripture that we learn his name, learn his, his purpose. Zion will be highlighted by a key contributor um, chosen by God. I've already talked a little bit about him, and that is that choice seer. Week five, last week, or yeah, last week we talked about being in the city, within city limits was the title of last week. Zion features his capital city, and it's going to be tucked up in, in, this, in this Mount Zion. The spiritual Mecca is going to move from old Jerusalem in the Middle East, where, where the spiritual hub has always been, and it's going to shift to another continent. And that's going to, why it's going to be called the New Jerusalem. I used a couple of, of examples. Um, New England, when, when the America or when the United States was first being um, established, in, those from England came to the Americas and they gave an entire region the title New England. Well, the same here. New Jerusalem will be established. God's message, it says in the word of God, will flow from high up in the mountains to those inside the city, within the city limits, and those outside as a call to more to come into to citizenship in this city. But there, you don't just get an invite. You don't get to come in just for no reason. You have to come in with the acceptance, the belief, the commitment, and the dedication to Jesus Christ. So now we come to week six. This week's theme, Live Like You Were Marching, was inspired by, and I'm assuming most of you know this, it's a song by Tim McGraw, or it's a song sung by Tim McGraw, not written by Tim McGraw, called Live Like You Were Dying. And um, his reference, Tim McGraw's reference, was to his father, a uh, Philadelphia Philly pitcher who... Um, whose name was Tug McGraw, and he had little or no relationship with his father growing up. In fact, he did not know his father was this famous man, Tug McGraw. Tim McGraw grew up, sorry for all the ancillary information, but I thought I'd fill you in on some of this, but Tim McGraw grew up as Tim Smith until he was 11 years old and, and found documents um, where he found that T Tug McGraw, this famous pitcher, was his father. Um, he never, by way of his own testimony, he never had any anger towards his dad. Uh, they didn't have a great relationship. He called him Tug, in fact, his whole life instead of dad because he had this father who had adopted him. Um, but he did have a relationship and it did get better. And once at age 45 that Tug McGraw was diagnosed with cancer, uh, their relationship grew closer uh, and expedited uh, quickly. They had to, to fill in some, some lost years. And, and so as Tug McGraw passed away, um, the father and the son actually had a, a strong relationship. But the words of this song, um, were written by another man for another uh, situation. But Tim McGraw says when he sang it, it was in reference to his father and it was very, is very moving if you hear it. Some of the verses from that that I hope translate well to our theme tonight are, someday I hope you get the chance to live like you were dying. And I would say, given our theme, that someday I hope all of you have the chance to live like you were marching. And I'm trying to recruit you to not just wait for Zion, but begin today, if you haven't yet, working for Zion. Live like tomorrow was a gift, says the song, and it challenges us to think about our own mortality. What would you do if you had information that you only had so much time? And it talks about what you did with that information. It talks about what you can do with it. And then lastly, that it repeats itself, what you would do with it. And so I hope over five weeks and maybe at the end of tonight, you'll say over six weeks that I've given you some information. And the, the question is for each of you, what, what are you going to do with this information? Are you going to live like you're marching or not? And I hope and pray that's what you what you um, uh, react. That's how you react to these classes. And I think most of you know. I uh, there are some absolutely wonderful seminars and teachings 
um, where we're told what to do, where we're told some probably deeper dives into the word of God, maybe deeper dives into the interpretation of some of those words. And those classes are important. My classes normally are um, a little bit of what to do, a lot of bit, a lot of how to and why to. And so I, I'm trying to stir your, your spirit to match your actions to what, what the directive is. So um, quickly speaking, keeping live like you're dying in mind. We're each finite creatures, okay? We might have questions along the way about when, but the finality of our individual lives are unquestionable. Okay. We're not getting out of this life alive, as, as uh, someone much more famous than I have said. Despite most probably none of us having a date certain, and it's one of my favorite uh, philosophical questions, if you could know exactly when your time to pass from this life was, would you? And so I'll, I'll just kind of leave that with you. Thinking that none of us would say yes or have said yes if the question was asked, we probably don't have a date certain. But we do have the certainty of this, we are going to pass. So with such finite details unknown, timing might be questioned, but not the fact. Most just see our passing as someday. You know, Candace and my new joke is when we when we get injured or we hurt something or something sore, the question is, is this one going to last for the rest of our life? Or are we gonna, is this going to go away? Because we're at that stage where some of our good friends kind of walk with a hunch or walk with a limp. And we think maybe this one's going to stay with us for 20 years or whatever we have left. So so most of us look to that day of mortality for ourselves as someday, undetermined, undefined but someday remains firm. I want you to understand, while we don't know specifically, we know that it's coming. Somewhere maybe indefinite about the when, but not, but it's absolute about the if. The answer is yes, all of us have that date. Why am I saying all of that? Well, that's as it is with Zion. I confess to you five sessions ago, that I had lost my personal enthusiasm for Zion. It wasn't happening. I'm getting older. I'm now 45 years in the church. When is this thing going to take place? And as I started to, to conclude that it's probably not going to involve me, I started to lose my enthusiasm, which is a very selfish approach. And so I'm, I'm trying to help some of you miss that, that bad walk that I was taking. So just as certain as your mortality, the peaceful reign is coming. Now hear this. It has as many questions to time and how and when and where, just as we do about our own death. But that doesn't, that doesn't create the question of if. It's unquestionable. Now, the reason we ask questions is there's no real hard evidence. And I say that with, with the unbeliever in mind. Meaning that while we have prophecies, all types, I mean, we did that all last week. We read through probably 20 prophecies just last week. To the unbeliever, that's just conjecture. So, like our own mortality, Zion is coming someday. Believe it or not. And I'm saying tonight, why not believe it? Why not embrace it? And if you do, why not start planning right now for this great gathering? There was a coach named Jim Valvano, and he coached for North Carolina State College Basketball. And at a young age, I think he was in his 40s, uh, he was diagnosed with cancer. And um, while his date certain hadn't been given, he knew he only had months to live when he had this famous speech and, and began the Jimmy V Foundation as he started trying to raise money for cancer. And a famous part of his speech is he said this, we need your help as he was crying to, or, or asking the people, not literally weeping, crying to the people for money, trying to raise money to, to battle against cancer. He said this, we need your help. It may not save my life, it may save my children's life or the life of someone you love. See, I threw that in because I wasn't finding that generous love. 
when I was thinking about Zion, I had already scratched my name from the list of invitees and attendees. And I lost enthusiasm. I didn't, this man had to be walked up to the microphone in this, in this famous speech. He could hardly hold himself up. He knew what he was asking for, he would not enjoy the benefit of. He had such love in his heart that he was asking so that others might benefit from his pleading. Magnificence. So I want you to see Zion with that generous enthusiasm, looking at it from through the eyes, if you will, of those you love. I'm not saying you won't get there. You may get there, but that's not the important piece of this. That's why I say, whether you ever march or not, live like you're marching. Let your passion be driven by a pure love for God and God's gathering and those who will be there, which may be you. When Jesus Christ was told, I asked the question, the greatest commandment, he said, love God, love others. You can fulfill that by looking to Zion with a generous heart. Your secondary, Zion, God, those who will attend are primary. Peaceful reign can remain your personal quest, just as it was for Jim Valvano raising money for cancer that he would never benefit from. But he understood there are those who will get there. Brother Joe Lavalvo, in one of my favorite sermons I ever heard him speak, and I think it was at a, a conference because I remember, just remember it was a great gathering, and he had lived his life, preached his life, filled with fire, always speaking of Zion. And I don't know if he was relenting. I don't know, I don't know what this confession was this day. But I know he was senior in years and he didn't live much longer after this. And he must have come to a conclusion. And he said this, I may not see Zion, but some of you here will. I remember being a young man of 20 thinking, I will. I'm going to see it. Now I, in some strange way, have turned and I'm now Joe Lavalvo saying, I may not see Zion. But I'm not going to give up that enthusiasm again. I've used this verse, and actually I'm going to give you a quote. I've even used that before, not in this context, but I've used it before, and I love the, the storyline here. The verse that I, I am so passionate about comes from the words of Jesus Christ, and he says, be converted and become as little children, not children, little children. I offered a couple comments about that. Our innocence as, as a little child provided clear choices for us. No layers, no added conflict. We, there was, it was purity. We didn't care about money. We didn't care about position, prestige, possessions. It was just innocent choices. Be converted and become as little children. I believe that's one of one of the facets to Jesus Christ's statement there. So when we properly at that stage we were properly prioritized. Now my question to us tonight rhetorical as it is, have we forgotten or are we still on course for the most simple, beautiful and important aspirations? Or do possessions creep into every conversation, at least mentally? Do, does position, prestige, self-love, uh, does, does that creep in and infect the purity of our decision-making? I believe that's why he said, be converted and become as little children. Some of you may know that picture. Some of you may, may know that source. When I was five years old, said John Lennon, my mother always told me that happiness was the key to life. When I went to school and they asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up, grew up, I wrote down happy. And they told me I didn't understand the assignment. And I told them they didn't understand life. Tonight, I wonder if I asked you what you want to be when you grew up or you grow up. You might say, I am grown up. I might challenge that. I don't, I'm, still, I'm still trekking towards a grown up. But I don't know that I have the purity in my heart to say, I want to be peaceful. 
I want to be happy. I want to be loving. Be converted and become as little children. Remember what it said earlier, peaceable followers of Christ. Those are, are they who are empowered with the Holy Ghost. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peaceable followers must live peaceable lives in order to be, to have peaceable walk amongst people. That's, that's how we usher in Zion. That's how we usher in the peaceful reign. They're going to follow us on that walk if we are those who are the peaceable followers. Now, I'm going to try to get you there with a couple strategies. Peace is often the result of mindfulness. Another, another way to talk about mindfulness is this. It's an awareness to what is desired and what is needed. What do you desire most tonight? And again, if possessions or money or power or, or, or prestige come in, we're, we're not back to being little children. Awareness to what is desired and needed. I want you to go back to that purity. Now, the opposite of mindfulness is mindlessness. And that's careless or foolish outlooks. And I wonder if that's not the conflict within each of us. Mindfulness and mindlessness. Said differently, mindlessness is unhealthy minds. Just wanted to show you a couple, couple things that attack a healthy mind. Okay? Um, unhealthy minds create uneasy, unsteady, tortured mental states. A couple words that come to mind for me. Greed. Greed is when you suffer from personal ones uh, by way of selfish desires. Again, prestige and, and power and possessions, excuse me. Hatred. I know we don't think of ourselves as hateful, but if ever there was a time in, our, in, in my life, at least in my 63 years, I've never seen hate spew so out in the open like it has been over the last couple of years. It's just astounding to me. Hatred is sourced in fear and often manifests through anger or rage, ire that is just right underneath the skin. I can't tell you the number of times in a week that I'm confronted with people who are ready to rage in the, in the simplest of moments. I was backing up, and, and I guess I'm 63 for sure now, because I'm backing up in a, in a parking lot the other day, and I hear a horn, and I, I must not have seen the car, and there's a car just a couple feet away from my car. Not quite as close as I anticipated by the way this horn blew. I thought, whoo, I almost hit somebody, but it wasn't that bad. And I put my hand, I said, I'm so sorry, so sorry. As I drove out of the, the parking lot, I saw the hand in the air out the window, still yelling at me. I thought, wow, I, what, what spirit uh, and, and what disturbance did this person have in them that my backing up has ruined their day and caused such anger? Last one is delusion. Delusion is nothing more than creating your own reality. It's a false reality as it is, but creating your own reality, kind of, kind of, if you hear something, you start to think worst case scenario and you build this case and it becomes real to you and you've made it all up. And I know this, there are people who live in such delusion, greed, hate, delusion, unhealthy minds. Each of these provide poor direction and a life trajectory that's not leading the right way. This is what's contrary to live like you were marching. Now, mindfulness is, is our first level ethical foundation. Mindfulness, being aware. What do I want? I want peace. I'm not there, but I want peace. Morals have no gray area at all. If truly we're focused on ethical foundation, there's no gray area. It's black or it's white. We try to create this area in between so that we have room to wiggle, but it, it doesn't exist. Just married a couple on Saturday night, and one of my counseling sessions along the way, as I talk to them about staying, staying true to their, to their loved one, 
said, once you get married, you're committing to them that you'll always be true to them. And I try to explain to them that it begins with your eyes. <laughs> it's not necessarily a follow through. It begins by just straying with your eyes. And then your mind starts to stray. See, and when we do that, we disrespect. And tonight I would say it's unethical. I made a promise not to ever do that. It's unethical to do that. Mindfulness is also about our attitudinal foundation. Now I'm going to follow up with those ethics. Now I'm going to follow up with God's righteousness and, and follow up with an attitude. It doesn't say that God loves a giver. It says God loves a cheerful giver. Being a giving spirit is an ethic. Being a cheerful giver is an attitude. Both important to mindfulness. So the first one is, is awareness. Being present, always present in your situation. So you're not caught off guard by a situation that'll take you down or, or, or mess with you so much so that, that it takes you into discouragement. Taking in the entirety of your surroundings. As a high school football coach, we used to tell our boys, keep your head on a swivel. What that means is always look around so you're never caught off guard by someone hitting you from one side or the other, as it is spiritually. Keep your head on a swivel and, and be mindful and take in the entirety of your surroundings. Awareness, acceptance, being at peace with what is. Doesn't negate our improving. Doesn't mean that I'm happy, I'm satisfied with where I am, I'm at peace with where I am, and I'm going to stay right here for the rest of my life. That's not what I'm saying. I often say that, that I hope I've adopted this as a mindset. I'm content with where I am, but I'm not satisfied. What that means to me is I'm content with where, the God, where God has me, but I want to improve myself, continue to grow. So I'm not satisfied in what I'm contributing to this relationship between God and I. He's given me everything I need. I want to return something back, acceptance, without giving in to, to say I'm not going to continue to grow. Number three, patience. We're looking, remember what this is. Mindfulness leads to a peaceful spirit. Peaceable followers of Christ. Patience, submission to God's timing. I find myself sometimes praying for something and then helping God by telling him what I need it by. Lord, I, I need you to rescue me. And can we get that done by Tuesday? And that's not God's timing. So I'm learning with age, submission to God's timing. It's a constant fight against man's impatience. Number four, non-judgment. Judgment, a judgmental heart is born from insecurity and low self-esteem. Sometimes it's a behavior learned and we're just repeating what we've seen. But what where the garden that it grows in and flourishes in is an insecure person with low self-esteem, looking to drag someone else down rather than picking myself up. I don't have the, the self-worth to pick myself up. So an easier way is to drag you down in my mind. We want to stay away from that. Peaceable followers of Jesus Christ in a peaceable walk with others. I can't walk peaceably with others when I'm judging them. Childlike mind. Be ye converted and become as little children. A childlike mind. It's an openness, an open-mindedness. And that seems to be a fight right now. You don't want to be open-minded. You want to know right from wrong and, and stay to it. But, but that also is contrary to being open. I want you to be open-minded. Something I, I, I always think of Mark Twain saying it, but I have experienced this myself. Mark Twain said he was amazed at, at, at age 17 how foolish his father was. And at age 22, he was stunned at how much his father learned in just five years. And it's a mindset. There's an arrogance of a, that sometimes we have from a, a young perspective, smarter than everyone around us. As the older we get, the more we realize we know nothing. I know nothing. Lord, keep teaching me. Childlike mind. Number six, trust. 
And I want you to know something. This one sounds like I'm, I'm skipping past it. I don't want you to hear that in my voice. Trust. I, I, I kind of tie this together with faith. But trust, despite life's destructive lessons, countless times you've been betrayed by people, situations, whatever it is, you felt betrayed. And so trust is hard to come by. Life has taught me don't trust anymore. And that distrust eats away like, a, like a, um, a mental or emotional cancer. Trust, have faith, believe. Those words will bring life to you. Distrust will eat away at your spirit. Lastly, and this is going to sound odd, especially to anyone growing up in the United States of America, a way to find peace is to stop striving. Now, we are a country built on striving, getting ahead, always working. Remember a, a manager I had, he said, we're so hard on ourselves. We, we think we don't work hard. He said, travel abroad and watch and see the work ethic that Americans have. Working into the night, working on their, now that we have computers and online, people are working till midnight, striving to get ahead. I know that the guy who has the same position as me works to 11, so I'm working till 12. And the minute the guy on my right finds out I'm working till midnight, he's going to work till one. So we're taught to strive, taught to spin. But what that is, is when we're striving and caught up in ourselves, we're not present. I started the, a new job probably eight years ago, and I was there for about a year. And the owner called me into the office. Uh, I was running the, the office. I was actually I was acting as president of this company. They call, he called me in. He said, I've, I've watched you with the other folks. I've seen the improvements you've made. He said, now I want you to assess me. What's your assessment of me? Says the owner of this business. And I said, well, I can give you an answer that will, will be soft and easy. And you're going to, it'll be easy to swallow. I said, or I can be truthful with you. Which one do you prefer? And he said, I want to hear truthfulness. I said, okay, and I'm not going to whitewash it. I said, you are never present. What do you mean by that? I said, you are never present for anybody in this office. You're always looking past everyone. There's always something bigger. There's always someone more important. No one ever feels like you're taking them in, in the, in the moment. Probably one of the hardest working guys I've ever met, always striving, always trying to get ahead, and never, never satisfied or happy with the results. Because there's always one more sale to make, one more client to get. One more dollar to make. He has a home that's four times as big as mine, and he wants it to be five times. So we're going to work harder. Striving. No peace. Five senses. We all function with five senses. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Tonight I want to introduce plus one, the mind. I want to bring the mind in as a sense for you. The mind is so much more than just thinking. Watch this. Watch this. In every single Asian language, mind and heart are captured by one word. They're not separated. We say mind and we say heart. In every single Asian language, mind and heart are one word. Why is that? Because mindfulness is more than just mental awareness. We sense through the mind plus the heart. How do you give your heart to the Lord without giving him your mind? How could you separate the two? It's impossible. I didn't just give my heart to my wife. She took my mind to, well, I, I think I'm qualified as mindless, but that's another conversation, another place. She take, I gave her my mind as well. I think about her daily, all the time, completely given to my wife. Heart and mind. Mindfulness is more than just, just intellectual awareness. It's every sense. You know, here's something that, that doctors have found. If you eliminate 
all but one of these senses, that other sense increases. I just saw a special, fabulous special on this man who was blind. And he said he could hear, he could hear in color. So he would walk, he would walk through a forest and make this sound, this clicking sound. And he would bounce the sounds off of objects in this forest and he could walk through without touching anything. And what he said was, he didn't just, he didn't just feel that there was a tree with his sounds, he saw, he heard in color and could describe the tree. When the other senses give up, that one sense kicks in and understands something. Each and every one of these five senses process through the mind, process through the heart. So tonight I'm asking you to process all that you're learning about Zion through your heart and your mind. Open both so that Zion is real to you today, whether it comes today or not. So it's real to you. Step one of mindfulness is bringing awareness to the reality of Zion. Mindfulness as it pertains to Zion. Bringing awareness to the truth of Zion. Here's the fact. Zion's coming. God iterated it, and then he reiterated it, and has continued to reiterate it for thousands of years. How many of you expect in the future for him to say, you didn't buy into that Zion thing, did you? That's been the running gag up here in heaven for thousands of years. We've been telling you Zion for all these years. It's not really coming. So if he's been saying Zion is coming and this grand and glorious gathering is coming, believe it. It's real. Step two of mindfulness is this. Bringing the same awareness that I asked you to bring about Zion, bring it to yourself. Transfer the truth of Zion to the reality that you have a role in the establishment of the peaceful reign. So mindfulness times two. One, Zion is real. Two, whether you see it or not, you are part of the establishment of this peaceful reign. He didn't call you to occupy a seat. He called you with purpose. He called you to fulfill a purpose. And one of those purposes is to help establish Zion. And you can do it today. Live like you're marching. Live like you're marching as a theme is a call to action. So once we understand God is the most important and relative to God, as the word says, our nothingness, we aren't. Once we get that, Jim Valvano got it. He understood as he gave that, that speech, he wasn't important. He had a role. <laughs> and his role was to plead, recruit, bring people to understand that they were needed to establish this, this foundation to raise money. He was the least important to a most important cause. You are, in, to, to, the, to the comparison to God, we are nothing in comparison. When we understand that, then we fully embrace in an uninhibited way this, this message of Zion. Maybe even there's a, there's a verse in the song that says, uh, what, what is he going to do? He, the question in the song is, what am I going to do now that, now that I've been told I'm dying? I'm jumping out of a plane. I'm parachuting out. And so I'm making the same uh, analogy and saying, we can fearlessly jump into our spiritual lives. That's full faith. I mean, to say, I believe in Zion and I'm going to work for Zion and have no evidence that's the same as jumping out of a plane. I'm asking you tonight to jump out of that proverbial plane and jump into your spiritual calling. 
with a willingness, a faith, a fearlessness. And this, this includes getting past any feeling of insecurity as we define in those three things that drag us down. Insecurity caused by feelings of being the least worthy. You ever feel like you're not worthy for any of this? And, God, and, and the evil one uses that to keep you paralyzed. Break free of that. Join me in tying for last place. Don't, don't worry about being the worst. Just join me in tying for last place. For all have come short. All. Oh, I'm part of all. I don't come shorter than you. You don't come shorter than me. We all come short. Agree. But Brother Doug, I'm not worthy. Yeah, I can't argue that. You're not. Okay, we pass that part of the argument. Now let's get to work. Now we've all agreed. None of us are worthy. Let's get to work. We can move forward despite our shortcomings and not call ourselves out anymore. The Lord loves us in spite of our condition. That's what unconditional love is. Live like your marching says it's time. Brother Paul Palmieri had that incredible experience probably 10 years ago. It's our time is what he heard. I think he heard the words. It's our time. Live like your marching says it's time. Not necessarily it's time for Zion now, but it might be. What if the call comes in tomorrow? Hey. We're all marching on the weight of holiness. You coming with us? Yeah. What do I pack? Absolutely nothing. Well, my iPad? I can at least bring my iPad, can I? Let's go. We're going. Simply, it's time. It's time to fully accept the truth of Zion. That's all. If you can come away tonight and agree that it's time to accept completely the message of Zion, and begin preparing in the same way that this, this coach Jim Valvano said. He ended with this, never give up, never quit. And that's what I'm asking you tonight. Don't fall short like I did in this particular case. For the last probably 10 years, maybe 15 years, I lost my enthusiasm. I'm sure I quit. I'm sure I gave up. Well, I'm not going to see it. And today, I've come no further in my assessment of when. I don't know if I'm going to see it, but I'm excited again because it doesn't matter if I get there. It doesn't matter if the money he raised would help him. He just wanted to help others. It doesn't matter if I get there. I want to help establish Zion for those who do. And as Sister Patty chided me last week, I might get there. So Sister Patty, yes, I might. But it's no longer important for me to maintain my enthusiasm. I'm excited whether I get there or not, because somebody's getting there. The theme that I hope you carry forward in your life is that you live like you are marching. May the Lord bless each one of you. This week's homework assignment. Number one, fully accept your conversion tonight. For me, it's 45 years later. Fully accept your conversion tonight and become as a little child. I know, but Brother Doug, when you say have faith, you know, I don't always get my answers. Uh, uh, child doesn't bring any of that into his prayers. I know, but but there was this time I was anointed and I thought I was going to be healed and I was, uh, no, that's not what a child brings in. Fully accept your conversion and become as a little child. Wipe the slate clean. Number two, simply this, decide what you want to be when you grow up, spiritually. That's all. Become as a little child and decide what you want to be when you grow up. What is it you want to see? What is it you want to experience? Take all the conditions away. You're a little child. Remember when you were a child, I want to be an astronaut. You didn't know if you could be an astronaut. That's what you wanted to be. I want to be this. I want to be that. No, just full faith. Whatever you wanted, you just verbalized it. What do you want? Spiritually. May the Lord bless each one of you.